Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who's gathered here this morning and who's watching online. Father, I just pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us to do the work that's needed inside of us and to give me the words to speak and open up the ears and the hearts of those who need to hear this message today. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. And all God's people said? Amen. Friends, Jesus got angry. We don't talk about that a lot, but in fact, Jesus got angry. Last week, we started a part one of two-part series on a book that I wrote called Reclaiming Anger. We started the conversation about the need to reclaim anger in our lives because we all deal with it, but the problem is we've discovered is that there's two ways to deal with anger. There's the way most of us do it, and then there's the way God does it. And the way most of us do anger, it leads to the destruction of relationships. It leads to just a devolving of ourselves. The way that we tend to do anger destroys the goodness, the balance, the rightness, and the truth in our lives and in our relationships. But the way God does anger is very different. God's anger doesn't seek to destroy. God's anger seeks to restore. God's anger seeks to restore goodness, rightness, balance, and truth. There's a Hebrew term for this. Do you remember it from last week? Shalom, right? This Hebrew idea that is embedded all throughout Scripture, and shalom it doesn't just mean peace. It's, shalom means the, re, the restoration of things, the rightness of things, the goodness of things, and the peace of things. And what we find is that God is all about restoring shalom. Restoring shalom to our lives, restoring shalom to humanity. The whole reason Jesus goes to the cross is to restore the shalom that had been broken and to bring us back into relationship with God again. And so the purpose of God's anger is always about the restoring of shalom to the situation. But this morning I want us to look at one incident from two different perspectives of Jesus getting angry. We're going to start Matthew chapter 21. Look with me, verses 12 through 13. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. John writes about the same incident, but puts it at the beginning of his gospel in John chapter 2. Verse 14 through 16. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And to be fair, you don't find the word anger explicitly written in either one of these two accounts. But what is clear is that Jesus gets angry. Now, to understand why Jesus gets angry and the importance of the story, you have to understand the role that the temple played in Jewish life. For the ancient Jews, the temple is the center of their society. It's the center of their culture. This is where God himself resides with the people in the innermost sanctum of the temple called the Holy of Holies. And so to go to meet with God, you go to the temple. To go be forgiven by God, you go to the temple. And so be glad that we don't have to do that anymore, right? But to ask for forgiveness of your sins required a sacrifice, You see, the Old Testament law required that there was an animal sacrifice be given to atone for your sins because the penalty of sin is death. And so an animal dying for you was to put some gravity to the fact that your actions, your sins mattered. And and so uh, something had to die for both justice to be served and shalom to be restored in the situation. So before you could be forgiven, you had to go sacrifice an animal at the temple. But you couldn't just grab any old animal. You couldn't go home and load up Fluffy and say, come on, we're going for an adventure. Couldn't do that. 
There were certain type animals. A lamb, if you were rich. And doves, if you were poor. But not just any old lamb or any old doves. They had to be perfect lamb. A perfect set of doves. They couldn't have blemishes. You couldn't have spots on them. They had to be pure in order to be uh, uh, to work for the sacrifice. The problem was not everybody owned perfect animals. And at some point, somebody along the way went, there's a way to make money at this. And so what began to happen over time is that merchants began to set up inside the temple walls for travelers who had come a long way from their villages to come and be made right with God but didn't have the right animal. And so the merchants were like, ha, 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 we got one for you for a fee. And so they began selling the animals for sacrifice inside the temples with a nice upcharge. Now, how many of you have ever been to Disney World? I love Disney. Disney is the happiest place on earth. My plan is for our family to go back to Disney next year, God willing, and COVID doesn't rise. But you know, if you've been to Disney, that that water bottle that you purchased at Walmart for $1.29 is going to go for about $5 once you enter into the Magic Kingdom, right? It comes a part of the territory. Once you enter in, it gets more expensive, and that's exactly what happens here. People are making money off of this forgiveness. It's supply and demand. If you don't want to go to hell, you're willing to pay a premium for forgiveness. Oh, but you can't use the Roman currency that was common at the time because that had Caesar's picture on it. And that's secular. You can't use that in the temple. So you need to exchange your money for temple currency for a fee. And then be able to use the temple currency to buy the more expensive animals needed for your forgiveness. Well, who do you think this affects the most? The people buying the lambs or the people buying the doves? The doves, right? Because the doves are what the poor people could afford. And so Jesus literally walks in and finds the temple merchants making money off the poor who are just trying to receive the forgiveness of God. Let me tell you this, Jesus gets angry when we stand in the way of somebody's forgiveness. Let me say that again and put a modern spin on it. Just kind of think through your own life, your own situations. Jesus gets angry when we stand in the way of other people's forgiveness. And so Jesus walks in, sees the sight, and he gets angry. He turns over the table of the money changers. John says in his gospel, he takes some cords and binds them as a whip and starts whipping them out. Get out. This is God's house, not yours. You don't deserve the right to make money off of my father's forgiveness. So this is what God's anger looks like. And if this is what God's anger looks like, then what does it look like for us? Well, I believe that there are four elements to God's anger that we need to use in our life as criteria to hold ourselves accountable to. I think there are four elements here to God's anger that as we start feeling angry, and we said last week that anger only is the, the, the alarm going off letting you know that shalom has been broken in your life. So when you start feeling angry, you need to look around in your life. Where has shalom been broken in my life? Because my anger is telling me that it has. And so as you start feeling this anger, we need to evaluate our anger based on these four criteria to make sure that we're doing anger God's way and not in a sinful way. Because if it's not leading back to shalom, it's going to lead you into sin. So number one, first element is purpose. God's anger has purpose. God's anger is always about the restoration of shalom. Remember, this goodness, this rightness, this balance and peace. And so Jesus gets angry to restore the function of the temple as a place of prayer and forgiveness, not a place for people to make money. So God's anger has a purpose. Does yours. What is the purpose of your irate behavior as you are giving 
modern sign language to the driver in front of you at a green light who is texting and not going through the light. You been there? What is, what, what is the purpose of your anger in that moment other than to make you feel good about yourself? What is the purpose of your anger, guys, some ladies, after you throw a tantrum after having a bad day on the golf course? Is it just to vent? What is the purpose of your anger when you... Uh, you berate your kids for having bad grades to teach them a lesson? What's the purpose of your anger when you're yelling and screaming at your spouse in the middle of a fight? To win? To be more respected? Does our purpose warrant the anger? If your anger is not bringing back shalom, it does not meet the standard of anger God's way. Now, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be disappointed. But you don't have to get angry because in doing so, if the anger's not leading to shalom, it's going to lead you into sin. So that's number one. That's purpose. Number two, action. God's anger has action. Jesus puts action to his anger. And anger without action is impotent. It will leave you very bitter and very frustrated. We have to put action to our anger or it just sits there and stews under the surface. And we end up lashing out against all the wrong people at all the wrong times. Have you ever had a scenario where you had a really frustrating day at work and you come home and the slightest thing sets you off and all of a sudden you are angry with the people you love the most in the world, but is it really about the people you love most in the world or is it you didn't deal with the stuff that happened earlier in the day and now you're taking it out on them? You see, if you have the proper purpose for your anger, which should be shalom, then your actions are gonna align with your purpose. And that means that those actions, they aren't about revenge but to bring back peace. I preached this two-part series several years ago in the Woodlands, and after part one, there was a church member who was a friend of mine. She had always dealt with anger the way most of us as Christians dealt with anger, just kind of suppress it, don't deal with it, or don't ever address it when we flare up with anger. And so she never had this theological understanding of shalom and how anger alerts you to the fact that shalom has been broken. We need to be people who are restoring shalom in our lives. So this was like groundbreaking for her. And she went home and she did something about it. She had a roommate who was an abusive alcoholic. And when she was in that state, would be a terror to live with. And so for years, she had just kind of suppressed, the, uh, the church member had suppressed her, her anger about the way that she had been mistreated for all this time because she just didn't deal with it. But after hearing this, she recognized she needed some shalom returned to her life. So she went home and told her roommate, I'm moving out. I'm done in this kind of friendship relationship. I'm not, going to be, I'm not going to be the doormat for your dysfunction anymore. And she did. She moved out. And she came to me. She said, David, did I do what was right? You know, I, I realized that my shalom had been broken. I was angry about it. And I felt like I needed to get out of the situation. And I told her, I said, your anger is leading to right action. It's about restoring your shalom and for you and her to finally stop perpetuating a cycle and actually for her to find some healing. So are your expressions of anger seeking to bring goodness, balance, rightness, and peace? That's number two. Number three is perspective slash proportion. God's anger is always within perspective and within proportion. And to demonstrate this, we're going to look at what the absence of perspective and proportion looks like. Take a look.
Maybe she'd been on one too many Zoom calls. I don't know. I don't know what it's telling of our nine o'clock crowd, but they were cheering her on in the service. I can't watch that and not have a few observations. First observation is if, it was a, if that was a Mac over a PC, she wouldn't be doing it, right? Any Mac people in the room? Four of you, thank you. Let's stick together. I got some, oh boy, they were booing me at the, an earlier service for the Mac thing. <laughs> got a feisty crowd today, all right. Second observation, you notice while she's doing this to the laptop, there's another woman who comes running up. Now notice she doesn't run to, to see if she can help. She doesn't run up and see if she can like lower the, the temperature of this woman and kind of assess the situation. No, she comes up, pulls out her cell phone and starts recording this thing, right? You know, I think this woman, bless her heart, whatever is, happened that day, um, she lost perspective, can we agree? I don't know what, what the computer did, but I don't think it did anything to deserve that. You know, when we fly into a fit of anger, we're almost never angry at the thing that we're taking our anger out on, it, are we? It's always about something we haven't addressed that we haven't worked through. That's why it's important to have proper purpose which leads to proper action because without proper purpose and action, we lose perspective. And boy, you saw at the very end of that, she just goes hulk on that laptop. She just rips it in half. You know, that's proportionality overload. Jesus keeps his anger in proportion to the offense. He throws over the tables. He doesn't call down lightning bolts, which he totally could have done. We need to maintain the same. You know, we should be more angry that our neighbor is in an abusive relationship than we are angry that our neighbor backs into our mailbox. Those two things are not equal, and they shouldn't be. We should be more angry about the plight of the poor in our community than we are the poor service we got at the last restaurant we ate at. Those two things should not be equal, and we need to recognize that. Now, I gotta say something. I know some of us in here struggle with bad tempers. If that's you, let me offer a tough word, but a good one. You know, if you're known by your family and friends as flying off into fits of rage where, where there's no proportionality, uh, there, uh, then I need you to listen to this. Bad tempers are often a sign of belief in a bad God. Bad tempers are often the sign of a belief in a bad God because the God of the Bible says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. If we're known for having bad tempers, we need to reevaluate who is sitting at that number one spot in our lives because Jesus wants us to be known for something other than our anger. So that's number three. Number four, limited duration. God does not stay angry forever. Isaiah 12, 1 says this. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Jesus doesn't stay angry with these money changers. He deals with it. He brings back shalom. He moves on with his life. God always has an end game for his anger because there is always a purpose. God's anger is never open-ended. Do you have a final ending point for your anger? Or do you find yourself just angry all the time? You know, if you were to light a match, that flame can be very, can be very useful. You can do a lot with that open flame. But if you hold on to that match for too long, you will get burned. 100% of the time, you hold on to a match for too long, you will get burned. Anger is very similar. It can be useful. 
it can help bring restoration and shalom to the situation. But if you hold on to that anger for too long, 100% of the time, you are going to get burned and you're gonna get hurt a whole lot worse than the people or person you are angry against. But God's purpose for anger is always shalom. And shalom is often marked by forgiveness. God's anger comes to a close when forgiveness is received. God's anger comes to a close when forgiveness is received. So for God, anger and forgiveness, they're intertwined. God doesn't do the one without coming back around to the other. And I believe that forgiveness or anger without forgiveness is kind of cheap. Anger without forgiveness is a good indication you've probably done the anger wrong. Now, it doesn't mean that every relationship that kind of got to that place where anger was necessary to bring back some manner of peace, it doesn't mean that every relationship is going to go back to the way they were. But that your anger can come to an end. God's anger has a limited duration. Does ours. But the question I want to leave you with today is, is there someone you need to forgive in order for your anger to come to an end? Is there someone you need to forgive in order for your anger to finally come to an end? I want to close with the last part of this temple story as told by Matthew. So Jesus drives out the money changers and the merchants and immediately following this this passage, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Directly following Jesus, pushing those out who were the obstacles for forgiveness, who shows up? The blind and the lame. See, Jesus' anger had purpose, it had action, it had proportion, and it had limited duration. And it led to this, that the poor, the brokenhearted, the lame, they came and found God and found shalom in their lives once again. Friends, this is anger God's way. It's what it means to be angry and not to sin. So may we Learn to be angry like Jesus and forgive like him too. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who has gathered here today. I thank you for the fact that you have equipped us, Lord, with the emotion of anger. And that it's not always a bad thing if we know how to use it, utilize it well and to follow your principles in engaging with it. But Father, I pray for those of us who struggle with our anger that we would submit ourselves to these criteria. God, that we would evaluate our situations and help bring back shalom and not further break down shalom. Help us catch ourselves when we are doing the latter and return to the former. But Father, I pray that you would be at work in our lives as we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.